Hi there, it is great to have you with us if you're watching live and also if you're listening back on the podcast. I hope you're all having a, a good time and you're uh, keeping well during this crisis as always. Um, today, hopefully having a really fantastic start to the week on a Monday, not partly because I have a glass of wine in hand, uh, but also today's guest is someone who's absolutely fascinating in terms of what they're up to in the music world at the moment and also giving insight as to what music people are up to as well. Um, so uh, today I'm with Alistair Tate. So Alistair, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Um, glad you've got your glass of wine there, so we can do a cheers now. Exactly. Digital cheers. It's the new way forward, I think, which is the best way. <laughs> Should we is, start on what, what we're drinking? Is that a, a better start? <laughs> I think that sounds a very good start. So, you first. <laughs> uh, so I've got a, a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc uh, via Maria, uh, and we both seem to have gone for white today, which is a good sign as well. We have. It was sunny about five minutes ago until the clouds just came in outside in the garden. So I've gone mm. for a burgundy... Um, little vineyard called Montagne, um, yeah, nice and creamy and crisp. Perfect. Um, I've, yeah. I was talking to someone the other day actually about seeing how many different musicians are now starting cooking uh, channels or various mm. different uh, ways of talking about their cooking, which I think there's definitely a food and musician tie we in there can, somewhere. Yeah, we can get into that later if you want. I mean, that's been the thing that's kept me going. <laughs> what am I cooking tonight? It's it's great fun. Keeps me keeps me sane. Exactly, you need yeah. some, some sanity in there somewhere. So, um, for people who are watching or listening who, who don't know who you are, you are Chief Executive of YCAT, um, but I think it would be quite fascinating to hear how you define yourself and who you are in the world as well, which is a small question as always. It's funny, it's a small question. It's a really interesting one for me and a difficult one, actually. Um, until someone about a year ago asked me the question, I sort of hummed and hawed and went, I'm this and this and this, and said, but actually, you're, you're a musician, you're a cellist, and I'm like, yeah, of course I am. So my background, I am a cellist. I'm a musician. I studied, obviously, in Scotland for years when I was growing up and then went to Royal Northern for six years, studied with Ralph Kirschbaum and a friend, went out to Switzerland to continue studying. And during the time there, I joined the Belcher Quartet, who were just in their first years coming together. Interestingly, had at that point just been accepted just as I joined onto Y cat um as a quartet and so right at the beginning of the quartet i moved back to london and then we had the next 10 years um of the most amazing experience um so i was in the quartet for 10 years and during that time it was from really our first concerts around the country with y cat to the first festivals then to we were the first new generation artists in bbc um and then EMI debut artist, which led to the EMI recording contract. And it was such a whirlwind. I mean, I wouldn't change anything. In fact, it's informed every aspect of who I am in so many ways. Musically, personally, what you learn about yourself from being a quartet is quite extraordinary, I think. Um, I wouldn't even say good or bad. It's just in its entirety. And after about 10 years, just realizing we had done so much, it had been such a non-stop roller coaster. And one thing I was really passionate about doing as well was doing lots of teaching. Um, and when you're on the road so much, it's very hard to do that. And um, made the decision to leave the quartet. And at that point, I'm not sure, coincidence, synchronicity, the Royal Northern College in Manchester, where that was my alma mater, six years, as I said, and the head of chamber music, there, who'd been my chamber music coach for many years, Christopher Rowland, had just been diagnosed with terminal illness. Within a day of phoning and then finding out, it was a very strange coincidence. And I went up immediately after the day after my final concert at the Wigmore with the quartet, actually, Schubert Quintet. And then the next morning, I arrived in Manchester in preparation for their huge chamber music festival that was happening at the very first week of January. And it's sort of a baptism of wonderful fire, um, in a way, um, getting about 100 groups ready for an entire festival of Russian music. I mean, it was really full on. And just carried on traveling up there two, three days each week um, for the next three, four years. And actually took over from Chris but once he sadly passed away. But that experience of working with him was so important for me. I um, really felt like a passing of something on he had this urge to really enthuse and sort of share as much as he possibly could about his incredible life 
And so it really felt such a privilege to be able to carry that on and try and really build the Chamber Youth Department into something really cross school, the entire conservatoire. And while I was there, I was teaching Death in the Maiden Quartet in my room one afternoon and I'd left my phone on. Cardinal crime left my phone on <laughs> as you're teaching. And it went off and it was Sir Brian McMaster who at that point was, the, he was one of the trustees of YCAT, but I'd known him, he was director of Redmond Festival for years. And I'd known him when, obviously in the quartet, we were playing a lot up there. And he just said, would you be interested in thinking about running YCAT? And I was thinking, what on earth? Why would I want to go and do something? I mean, that's, I mean, I love YCAT, but why would I want to go and think about being an agent? And he just said, no, 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 think about this. And I gradually started overnight. The thought hadn't gone. Then the next night it hadn't gone. And the third night it hadn't gone. My phone back said, yeah, let me think about this and really think what I could bring. And it was such a quick realisation. It was so easy for me as a Waikat artist when we were there to think, they're our agent, they're our manager. But actually Waikat is so much more than that. And I think that's what really spurred me on to say, yes, I'd love to try this. Um, because it was the whole holistic approach to artists. Um, at that really important point, how do you support an artist in its entirety? It's not about getting commission. It's not about making money. Um, it's entirely generated by fundraising. It's there to really look after the most interesting artists at that transition point to really help support them, to allow them to grow. So, so yeah, I accepted that and was able to do that part time for the first three, four years um, between Manchester and YCAT. So yes, two part-time jobs. I suppose both are full-time jobs in a way, but you just balance that um, with the Virgin train journey in the middle <laughs> each week, sometimes twice a week. And at that point, my triangle of sort of my house in Kentstown in London, YCAT in the centre of London, Manchester, that triangle, then there was an opportunity for it to contract in a very healthy way when Guildhall were deciding that they wanted to really create a similar structure to put chamber music right at the heart of the curriculum. Mm. And so I became head of chamber music at Guildhall. So my triangle moved, but it really became a much more balanced three sides. So Kentstown, Guildhall, Central London. And as of the last three, four years, due to a really, really important legacy that came in that helped support a few years of growth for YCAT, um, I've now been doing YCAT full time. And still teaching, it's really important for me to teach. So I still, I travel a lot abroad and do master classes. And I was meant to be in Paris last week. Um, actually, of course, that's not happening. Um, I meant to be, was meant to be flying to be the jury on the Osaka, one of the biggest chamber music competitions um, next week. That's not happening. I'm still doing the Duolingo though every day. Oh, I've got to, to try and learn. I just case. thought it was really good. I'm trying to do it every day. And actually it's been great fun. It's it's one of these little things you suddenly get time to add into day, which has been really good fun. So incredible, and um, it's really interesting to see that Schubert seems to sort of tie in with some nice changing points in your your career as well. There always seems to be Schubert in there somewhere, with the uh, the quintet and uh, Death and the Maiden. Yeah, I mean you can't live without Schubert. Exactly, <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> couldn't agree more. Well, it's yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, it also leads me nicely to ask just exactly what is YCAT? Because I think it sits in a really unique space, not just in the UK, but also uh, internationally as well. There are there are very few things that are like yeah. YCAT. So uh, what exactly is it? It's, it is unique, actually. Um, it was formed 35 years ago. Sir Ian Hunter at the time, who one of the biggest impresarios um, at the time, all with Harold Holt Management, Concert Promotion, Edinburgh Festival. He... And some of his colleagues within the, even then, the commercial management world were realizing that for them, some of the most interesting young artists who were emerging from conservatoire at the time, they weren't at that point commercially viable in the way that what they needed in order to really flourish wasn't going to be bringing in lots of commission for a few years, but they needed a lot of time they needed just getting out in the road doing lots and lots of small performances music societies amateur orchestras um as well as bigger concerts as well so just meaning that when you maybe had your in those days debut at the wigmore 
um, you weren't just going in cold. You'd already performed that recital 10 times. You knew what it was like to be a performing artist through experience, not just through someone telling you. Um, but that, as I said, that wasn't a really commercially viable option. And so it started very small. It was modeled in a similar organization in America. But of course, America is a very different territory, even in those days and now even more different uh, um, in its scale and scope and priorities um, called Young Concert Artists. But YCAT started very small. The crucial point is that YCAT is more, we're about 85% reliant on trust foundations and philanthropy, um, as opposed to a commercial management, which is 100% reliant on commission. So that in itself is a very different approach to an artist at that point. Um, our job is always to put the artist's needs absolutely foremost. Do they need this concert? Is it right for them at the right? Is it the right time for them? Is it the right repertoire? Of course, commercial managers all think about this as well, but there's not this real need to, to push, to really drive a career. We're there to give space. We're there to allow things to happen at the right time. Um, the word I often use is that it's a it's a hundred percent developmental for the artist. What is right for them at the right time, and making contacts and also getting them to really think about what's involved in an artist manager relationship. Um, it's not just sitting. As many young artists, way too many young artists, still have this slightly ideal image that I get an agent and I have a career. Uh -uh. Absolutely not, sadly. It, however, if you are taken on by an agent, what I think is you then have this opportunity, you have a, a window to form a relationship where then you have a partnership of working together. You need to inspire your manager. That, so what we're looking for for our artists is it's not just the delivery. For, I mean, delivery across the board internationally now. Standard is... I mean, you can't even talk of standard, it's through the roof um, level. But what's the qualities? They're the things that I'm really looking for. Who's curious? Who's hungry? Who's really thinking about what they need to share? What's their need to share? Why do they need to share something with someone? Is it because they want to be famous and they want a career? Well, I, for me, that's not what music is. Music is that you can't not do it. It's this burning need to need someone else to share a connection with um, in order to discover more about yourself. It requires vulnerability. It requires a certain fragility in a way. And I think a curi increasingly a curiosity about what's going on in the world. Um, I think many young artists I now come across are, they can seem still quite closed in rather old fashioned way of thinking about the music industry. Um, I don't blame them. What I often think is that it can stem from a little bit of anxiety, almost fear of letting themselves realize how big and competitive and difficult the industry is. Um, and thinking that, yeah, am I going to make it? There's no guarantee. Um, so lots of questions. Mm. So again, back to what YCAT is, we have annual editions each year. So again, we don't just go and select an artist. It's open to anyone, but it's very rigorous. The whole process is a really tough process, not because we want to be mean, but because we want to find artists who already are at that point where they have the resources, they have the backup, they have the foundation, which means we can throw them into any situation and know they're not going to sink. They may take a while to swim, but they're going to survive and they're going to learn so much about that through that journey. And what we do, we're the only organisation that gives, it's not just one year of a few concerts, it's this full, holistic care and attention to the artist, part of which involves building concerts. And over that time, three to five years maximum, we let them find their own voice, whatever that might be. So it's about potential. And in the last 10 years, as a sign of success, over 80% of the artists we've looked after have then moved successfully. We've passed them on successfully to some of the biggest international managers. 
fantastic. It is so much that Wildcat does that's that's fantastic and unique. Um, I'm going to give you a chance for a mini wine break while I talk for two seconds, uh, as wine is always important. Um, just I've, you have to keep just cutting in on me, by the way, because I can the just best talk way. and talk. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the best way. But um, I was talking in my chat with Anne Majette uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, mm. She was saying that she'd spoken to some artists who were really quite thankful for the break in a way during this period. And it was an unusual thing to thank, but because they've been on the road so much and touring relentlessly, this is actually a good thing. And I think it's great to hear that, that Wygat hasn't obviously pushed them, your musicians and people on your roster to have a rigorous performing uh, career just for the sake of doing more concerts. In effect, it's looking after the whole artist and having space for creative freedom or personal growth or uh, just managing the, the stresses of going from nothing to a potentially an international touring career which is rigorous at the best of times um so i think it's fantastic there's that side and one thing you also mentioned was the word holistic which is actually what i was going to say and you have this holistic approach to your artists and one thing that you've done very recently is finding a new way to support them through this crisis as well so what have you managed to do to support your musicians who now have no concerts for the foreseeable future so middle of march when the UK was still a bit behind everyone else. Well, people, I think, other countries in Europe, but um, we were still in the office. But the day before we were told not to go into the office, really, and start working from home, we were already seeing the the deluge of cancellations that were just flooding in. Um, and we realised that even at that point, that was till mid-April, just a roster of artists had already lost something like £90,000 of earnings just in one month. I mean, it was really crazy. Um, and of course, we weren't even to know um, that within about another two weeks, pretty much, well, the entire concert diary for them all had gone up to, at the moment, we're now looking at the beginning of September. Um, mm. The last concert to go in the diary was um, Gestatt Festival, which just went yesterday ah. for one of our singers. So, um, not it's not surprising, but we just thought we have to do something for them. I mean, yes, there's a huge priority. We have to think about YCAT as every organization has to think about how do we um, keep ourselves going? How do we allow ourselves to grow? And that relies on fundraising. But actually the reason YCAT exists is for its artists. It's not for YCAT. That's why we're a charity. We are there to serve our artists. That is our charitable mission and they have no earnings. So we, we luckily been doing quite a lot of thinking the last few months and have just launched a new website about three weeks before, um, which has the capacity for some great fundraising tools. We'd also, for the first time as well, just employed our very first marketing communications manager, who Barbara, who has been incredible. The timing is just crazy amazing for us probably really strange for her she'd been in post for one week pretty much and that was it <laughs> baptism but of fire between then here and our development manager we were all thinking in the office what can we do for them and so we set up a mini campaign just a hardship fund on that first day when we left the office thinking let's put a target if we can get five thousand pounds to give to the artist let's think about this and also what we immediately did we went into our reserves and we don't have big reserves. It's something we now really need to build up. Um, but we have enough reserves and we thought this is a perfect use. And we took some money to give to the artists immediately just to say it's not much, but here's a little bit to tide you over. And we also had told them that we're covering any of the lost travel accommodation, all the expenses that had already been booked and paid for months in advance. Mm. So they're not out of pocket for that. So we set up this campaign for 5,000 and last week we were able to announce that we'd actually gone through just over a hundred thousand pounds, which I was amazed at, but it's just been incredible. The support from so many wonderful, wonderful people who believe in YCAT, they believe in the artists, but I think really recognize this real need for the artists at the moment. I also think, in a rather cynical way, it, the timing was really important for us as well. We got there right at the beginning, and I think it was, maybe cynical is the wrong word, it is the wrong word, um, but it was an opportune moment. We got in there quickly with a hardship yeah. fund. There were so many of these funds happening there. 
But I think it's because of our mission. And it's something we, I would say every day in some way, we come back to thinking, who are we there for? What does this artist need? We're not there to just deliver YCAT. YCAT is there first and foremost to help the artists in whatever ways they need. And at the moment, they need support. So mm. so it's, it's been hugely encouraging. Um, and a, for me, a really good news story in amongst rather a lot of gloom and doom. Very much so. And it's, moment, so. as you mentioned, it's really, really refreshing to see how people have come around to support music. And I think quite rightly that people are supporting health workers and the NHS and various elements that are supporting the fight mm-hmm. against COVID first. Mm-hmm. But equally that those who are able to then support further and support the arts, it's been truly touching that, that people have really dug deep to help people. Um mm-hmm. And as you say, that uh, things are getting cancelled till September. Um, I was speaking to someone the other day who heard of concerts being cancelled in December time by a, a venue. So I think there's certainly this long-term uh, difficulty that we're going to have to struggle with. And likewise, there was an interview with um, Sir Simon Rattle, who was saying that they're not planning till November, December as well. So it's, or they can't plan with Absolutely. any certainty. So it's a unique with any certainty. Concept. And yes, it's it's difficult. It's frightening in a way. For artists who have got so used to one way of operating but mm. I mean within it it's the positive way of looking at it is that it's a real creative opportunity for people um, I'm very very conscious that everyone's in the same boat suddenly um, the world is flooded and full of people needing to be heard um, what we're saying quite a lot when we're talking to our artists and thinking about online content. Obviously, it's very important. It's going to be majorly important as we go on. How do we think about it? We were already thinking about it before. Um, It's not just because of COVID, but obviously things are very much kick-started and uh, sort of sped up a bit in the impetus here. Um, But I really believe that there is a difference and there might be a bit of a reckoning point quite soon between those who are producing tons and tons of content because they're desperate to be heard and those who are creating content from i'm going back again to this need to really share something authentic and genuine and of quality and so i think that's what we're really looking at i mean thinking of the hardship fund again when we it was a wonderful idea barbara marketing manager had and we put together this beautiful video. I, I cried when I saw it, saw the first draft of it, um, just as a thank you to everyone when we announced the £100,000 target we got to. Um, I just thought there's been so much music. We don't need yet another online concert or another um, living room concert at this point. And we just got all the artists to read out a line of Schubert's and and back to Schubert, there we are. Exactly, it's all about Um, Schubert. (laughs) And and the Andy Musique, which I just think seeing it, it, I direct you to the YChat YouTube channel and just see it because it was just such a beautiful little rendition um, of them just speaking these really, really extraordinary words. Mm. No, it's, it really is incredible just how much you've managed to, to raise to support your musicians. Um, you, you mentioned obviously that the the loss of learning, the loss of earnings that they've had, um, which obviously is affecting uh, them directly. Um, Ycat's in a unique position by being a charity and not necessarily commercially driven. But I know that for the, when musicians go on to the next step and they're with artist managers and agencies, etc., that's going to have big financial implications for how the sector works. Um, how do you think it's currently affecting artist managers? Um, and do you think in future there'll be less travel for, for their, their people on their roster, etc., cetera, and, um, and things going forward? I think there's a huge amount of thinking necessarily going on at the moment. Um, already one of the very established artist managers, artist management companies, has sadly gone has sadly had to close down um, about a month ago. Um, I think the entire commission model is something that's very, very difficult for people to look at. Um, I think it's not just artist management. I think it's symptomatic of everything, if we think much more broadly. Um, This compulsion in our society to grow and grow and grow, that growth is the only way of going forward. Um, And I think certainly a few decades ago when 
there was the opportunity for growth to be sustained by huge recording contracts, um, huge signings, um, perhaps very, very overinflated fee structures. Um, so, but once things are in place, it's very hard for things to then scale down. Things either need to just maintain or keep growing. And maybe this has been a point which, even though it's going to be very uncomfortable for lots of the industry, is a real slimming down and getting back to what is it mm. that are the core values that are needed there. Um, so that's quite philosophical in a way, but I think really important. But yeah, I think artist management are going to be really looking closely and having to think carefully about their role both with artists and also maybe for artists. How much are they needing artist managers or what are they needing them for is another important question. And as artists themselves are having to think a lot more about just doing things on their own in their living room. Who knows what will happen six months on. Very true. And I, I totally agree that potentially for some artists, in, in some cases, they may not need to have uh, an agent or a manager um, even prior to this crisis. And historically, there was certainly a very vital role that agencies played with having contacts, especially on an international scale mm -hmm. for finding things. But now with the uh, the rise of the internet and being able to find contact details and network online, also um, because I'm a bit of a nerd, things like content rela uh, customer relationship management tools like HubSpot, where you can fully manage yourself and your contacts and your database and do reminders and all sorts of crazy things. Technically, all the tools for someone to manage themselves are potentially there if that's the right journey for them. So I think it's an but interesting I also, But I do think that there's a, I mean, within a manager role, if we drop the term manager, for artists, really sort of individual artists or ensembles the top of, at the top level, it's so important to still have a very honest sounding board, a very honest kind of feedback um, to really think about ideas, to help them shape it, to give perspective, um, to actually be having different types of conversations with the promoters so that it's much harder for the artists to have themselves. Um, and so I think there is a real role there. It's really important um, and can be very creative. And when it is seen as a real sort of dual role and real partnership, but that's very different to then when you take into account a commission model and all the expenses and size of offices that are needed to be sustained as a career, an artist management as a career and a musician as a career. And sometimes there's a bit of an inherent conflict between these two things. Very true. And um, I think partly as well, um, you mentioned earlier about your musicians not necessarily understanding the industry. Uh, and I think that's a very key point. Um, it actually came up in the conversation with Anne that when I was studying, mm. I just assumed that critics were there just to be annoying in most of the cases, where actually they serve a very good purpose for showcasing what's going on in the industry and informing audiences of what is potentially mm. worthwhile and what isn't, or uh, if something is overinflated. Um, and likewise, yeah. you, as you mentioned, that artist managers and agencies, their job isn't just to get gigs, it's also to help develop careers, uh, point of views, uh, general ethos and, and other elements as well. So there's certainly a lot more involved in just the, I will find you a gig and you will earn money if you sign with me type situation. It's quite different actually, I've learned over the last years, um, the way the two artist managers and in Europe, how that's evolved as opposed to let's say North America, where very much there's still this, um, difference between let's say a manager and a booking agent and it's it's quite interesting when you speak to different managers in the states and um the, even the way the conferences the big artist manager conferences happen in the states um compared to europe it's a very different um feel the sort of drive to deliver dates or the slightly more holistic around about it but i mean that's all generalizations and i'll probably get shot down by many people about upset so <laughs> no it's i'm it's used a... to it <laughs> very true and it's good to have sort of a general overview of the, mm. the spheres even when there are individuals uh who obviously will be different within that so it's mm. certainly with a pinch of yeah. salt but um I know Wildcat also looks at trying to, to provide for young musicians who are outside of your roster as well, which is, again, something very unique you, you do. Um, what else does Wildcat do? Because I think, in effect, that your mm. artist management side is almost 50% of your output, in effect. Yeah. About three, four years ago, when we were thinking of, well, <laughs> thinking of the opportunity <laughs> to grow a bit more. Um, but again, it's going right back to core mission. 
Um, and yes, we have a very elite roster each year that's constantly refreshing, but it's still maximum maybe 20 artists, 15, 15 maximum 20 artists that we can be looking after. And I think from my background, I mean, teaching, working in the conservatory sector so much, I have another hat I didn't mention earlier, but as a, I'm actually a psychotherapist as well, um, trained and not working within music, very clearly not within the arts, because it's just very hard. I know way too many people. Um, <laughs> but the idea of this, how to help people really think about their careers. Um, and the number of musicians who are so talented, as I said, but coming out of conservatoire and the conservatoires, I always really defend them. They come under a lot of criticism, I think, from people about not providing enough professional development training and they're not equipping their students for future careers. And I know there is so much energy goes into that in all the conservatoires in this country. But I think there is there is a really important, more fundamental question of if someone has gone to conservatory for a training, they are wanting, there is a belief that they want to be a performer. And there's this whole idea of, is it, when they realize that maybe they're not going to be performing at the level or actually even actively performing in a way that they've always dreamed of performing, when is it healthy to really inject that question into their training? And that's seen as something healthy. It's not that they're giving up, but can sometimes they reorientate all their training to see this as the the most valuable thing that they've been given that can still be connecting to a much wider industry in ways that their own knowledge of performance and as an individual performing musician can be of such huge benefit in so many different aspects of the industry. But sometimes for a lot of musicians, it's only when they graduate that all these questions that people have maybe even been asking them while they're studying suddenly become real for them. When they actually have a bank account and they have to think, oh, how am I going to pay the rent? I've not got a student loan. Oh, I now have to pay the student loan back. What am I going to do? That's the point where they need somewhere to go. And there really isn't anywhere that's providing, again, I'm back to holistic mm. um, advice. So we set up sounding board. Um, in a way, the structure at the beginning um, still maintained, although, again, we're very flexible. We're thinking about it all the time. It was very much um, individual panel discussions where anyone can come to a sounding board seminar. We about all aspects of industry, um, health, well-being, not how to get an agent, but do I need an agent, um, how to market yourself, how to think about your finances, how, all the normal areas that um, musicians need to think about. Then also a second strand which people can apply for, which are one-off coachings, individual coaching sessions. Um, so I'm not being a therapist, but at the moment that's all been with me. That's a one-off coaching session. It's not about telling them what to do, but it's very much a reflective space for them when they really feel they've been trying a lot of things. And just often the question is, I just feel I'm hitting a brick wall. I keep sending letters out, what's not going on? And it's creating a space for them to really look a bit more about themselves and think, well, what is it I really want? Because often they've never asked themselves a question, but they know the answer. And they just need a space to actually make that move in their thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second layer. And the third layer was um, project mentoring, trying to really look at a whole range of projects. And again, not actively managing the projects for them, but really just giving them a bit of project mentoring. How do they um, break down um, getting a project off the ground into all its component parts? And what we've really been doing in the last year, thinking about it a lot, and again, now is the perfect time to be looking at the signing board. Our aim is very much to be providing totally, access totally accessible for all resource. That is, where do you go to ask a question? Now, even if we don't have the actual answer, even if you come to YCAT, hopefully then we can pass you on to the right person who will know the answer. And then part of that is to really build up a, um, what I see as a sort of online library. Um, Kieran, our development manager, often calls it 
sort of it's a bit like Joe Wicks or someone, the online personal trainer for the emerging <laughs> edition. Um, it's but a, great a whole way mix to look of it. courses, yeah, a whole mix of mm. courses, and and importantly, this isn't subscription. Mm. Um, I think it's so important with our model and our mission that this is something that is open to all emerging musicians, and it really brings YCAT sort of full circle to um, we are there to help all self musicians become self-supporting at all levels. Very true. And it's, um, I think what you said about having the space to reflect on what you want in the career is really important. I know that, um, as you mentioned, conservatoires can occasionally get flack that is sometimes unjustified for not providing enough PDP and various bits yeah. of helping people with careers. But in reality, the, the experience of being at a, a conservatory is actually very intense. I know that for me, up until finishing final recital, I just didn't have the headspace or time to actually reflect on what the next step was because you're so focused on what is quite a uh, an intense and direct path to one single goal. You, in essence, you're not actually given the, the space to reflect, which is good for getting the, the value for money for your tuition fees of actually having a lot on and, and doing bits. But it's, um, it's good that post then you're obviously trying to find ways in which to stimulate uh, that thinking and also the general time um do you need to have a, a small wine break or are you okay for yeah. the moment <laughs> i'm okay at the moment yeah. perfect i mean I'm it's, it's away no one's talk. i mean it's no one's fault mm. i think within conservatories but i think there's such a need for delivery yeah. and outcomes um and that in itself is in my in my view highly uncreative mm. but it's just a necessity as well for the model that has grown and grown over 100 years really certainly so so for also just as a, a slight aside, I feel huge amounts of sympathy for those who've just graduated in the previous year who will have left in um, what's uh, July 2019 yeah. um, because those in the UK aren't being covered by the uh, support for people who are self-employed because you need to have been there for 12 months. Yeah. Equally, your career won't be in a similar footing. So I think it's it's something that we as a sector we try and potentially investigate how we support those musicians who are trapped in this limbo land of yeah. no concerts but also no support for those who are self-employed um i've no idea what the answer to that would be um but i think it's i mean the, we... the short-term support absolutely is through i mean scheme light help musicians and their mm. their opening up of the scholarship and their role society musicians who help working with our musicians but i mean it's a a lot longer term it's a bit well very very difficult problem for people but again it's sometimes throwing the difficult questions at people sooner rather than later allows much more space for something much more fulfilling to emerge so who knows very true well one thing i, I think it would always be fascinating to ask you is your advice for young musicians who are looking at having a career as a performer um Obviously, it's a slightly more difficult question now, but what advice do you have for people uh, who are young musicians going forward in this new space and world we have? Which may be a million dollar question, because obviously it's a, uh, a slightly complicated one. I don't know if I'm the right person to answer this at this moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll quantify that. Just, I think there's so many questions around and no one knows what it's going to be like. Um, various people are approaching things in different ways as i said there's a lot of people who are very very active and needing to do and do and deliver and do and produce and and that's great in one sense i i would question if they're denying a certain questioning space again and really thinking about why they're doing it why they need to do it um but on the other hand you've got the flip side which are people who are taking this opportunity to go into an entire little bubble and think, yeah, this is this space that I've dreamed of. And isn't this wonderful? No, that's wonderfully creative. But it's when it comes from a point of denial about actually what's going on in the world. And music's place. Yes, we... Music is so... Of course, I'm a musician. I believe that there is such an important place for music as a unique space for people to reflect, to learn about themselves, to really... Um, I don't just mean performers, I mean everyone. To to actually lose themselves to actually discover more about what they're feeling and thinking and um there will always be a place for music but in the scheme of things sometimes it's quite hard to um balance that where when there is a massive need for people to just go and work in care homes and help people get better and provide ventilators and uh, 
we're very low down the pecking order at the yeah. moment. I couldn't agree um, more. So it's easy to think, well, we just need to just deal with it. But I think advice for young musicians, I keep coming back and it's a bit abstract, but it is important. Um, why are you connecting? Why do you need to connect with people? What is it that you genuinely feel you have something unique to say? Or are you just driving because actually you want to be famous? And I think they're two very, very different things. And for me, I know the one that I always go to more. Yes. We had a, so over the time, the last month, and our own artists, we've been putting out a lot of con a lot of content, but carefully, we're not, and again, we're clearly trying not to flood things. But those who really feel they've got something genuine to, to say, and quite early on, um, within the first few weeks, um, our accordion player, Sam Wiley, who's been in lockdown for now about two and a half months in Italy, and our mezzo, Emma, who had just managed to get back to Toronto before all the travel stopped there. Um, but they were meant to be planning their first amazing program, incredible program, together in both all, in Verbier Festival. They were also doing one in Rideau Festival, but Verbier in the summer, they were looking towards that. And so they've been keeping each other motivated across the Atlantic. And they just produced the most beautiful little video, which was just a private thank you to all of us, where they just put stuff together. And it was just so moving and authentic. And so we asked them and they edited it a little bit. And so we put that out. But that, for me, is something that's genuine. And it was a Balkan folk song, Emma's got Macedonian roots. And I mean, it's touching, it's genuine, it's heartfelt. Um, it wasn't. It started from a point of just being a very private communication for them. Mm. It wasn't saying, look at us. Um, so I think that's a big thing that I would advise people to do. Think about your motivation for things. Very true. I think it's, it's wonderful advice. And um, before we get on to the question I always finish on, uh, one thing I'm curious is obviously uh, being in lockdown and quarantine is always very difficult, especially when for you, you're also running a team as well remotely. How have you managed to, to stay sane during lockdown, which potentially may be cooking? Am from I the com sane? Am <laughs> Rel I? Relatively. Am I? <laughs> Relative is going to be the key word. <laughs> yeah. I think if you ask a few people, I think that word may not occur. But I anyway. won't ask the rest of the YCAT team, just in case. But no, no. Definitely don't, no. Um, how am I keeping saying? Well, I mean, structure's hard. I mean, cooking each day, that's been a structure. Um, we have regular Zoom meetings with the, the staff. We're um, Sue, our artist manager, and I, we're, at the moment, we're trying to just have a sort of Zoom chat with every artist at the moment so that's sort of planning that over a few weeks um i've also been doing lots of, i've spent today i'm doing a lecture on wednesday an online lecture for the european chamber music academy so that's been occupying a very different part of my mind and all about how to be together in an ensemble and the idea of pulse and um that's be, been yeah a very sort of philosophical space i've been in which has been really nice um yeah, uh, keeping saying reading, lots and lots of reading. Um, that's what I enjoy. Not so much online. I'm not a, I have to confess before you ask it, because I'm sure you <laughs> might, um, like my favourite online videos or stuff. But I'm not a great person at, I have, well, I will confess, I'm one of these people that's always managed to avoid Facebook from the beginning and never ever had a Facebook profile. So impressive. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit hypocritical when I'm telling all the artists that they must be in using the social media and thinking about the social media and what they're doing. And I'm afraid I don't. But <laughs> you work I in a different space, so it's yeah, that sounds so elegant. I'm, but I'm giving not. you, I'm giving you a get out there. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, a few, a few online. Actually, one of the funniest things I saw, I could, it was actually from my parents. Um, but they sent me this video from this hilarious guy in America. Um, oh, God, what's his name? Randy Rainbow. Right. <laughs> Which is hilarious. But actually, there was this really, it's sort of very satirical mm -hmm. videos. Like, there was one of um, Gilbert and Sullivan, um, the model of a major, a major, I always get this wrong, very model of a major gentleman, um, but all about Trump. Um, that was the a, a model of a very stable genius. And then the most recent one of that was um, a spoonful of Clorox to Mary Poppins. 
Wow. <laughs> that they're, they're kind of very, very clever. Yeah. Um, Cutting. Really funny. But apart from that, it's been nice, quiet space reading. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Listening to music, going for walks, drinking wine. Drinking eating. wine's always been helpful. Um, wondering when we're actually going to be back in the office. Yeah, it's very strange, especially because mm. obviously Somerset House, where you're based, is such a stunning venue as well. Um, and it's great to hear you say about getting for walks, because for me, having a dog and escaping into the, the countryside here in York has been perfect for some sort of yeah, mm. element of solitude. Um, but I won't ask you what's been your favourite online classical music content online, as we may have just covered, that's, that's mm. not necessarily been covered. Um, but for me, I was really fascinated yesterday watching the Young Musician of the Year, which isn't necessarily mm. online, um, yeah. which I had mixed feelings about as a programme, but I was completely not amazed, not just by the playing, but the actual the way that young musicians spoke about their music. And in yeah. particular, I've completely forgotten his name already, but the youngest pianist competitor, who I think was 12 or 13, came off stage mm. straight away from a very stressful situation. And his first words to camera were, I'm quite happy with that because I think I got what I wanted to convey in my message to the audience across to them, which I thought for, is a wonderfully mature way of thinking, but also a great attitude to have for a competition. And it's not for him. Absolutely. It came across well, as authentic. It's really interesting for coached. us because actually the one thing, I mean, I didn't mention, but we have a, Wycats had an incredibly important relationship with the young musician of the year hmm. for about 18, 18 years, I think, like 15, 18 years. Um, it's very behind the scenes, but when we get to the finalists, um, the three finalists, we're very much involved in what should have been should be happening actually this coming weekend, but obviously it's not happening at the moment in the finals. Um, but Wycat is there to really, I, I would go up, I mean, to my colleagues, Jess and Sean, we'd be going up this weekend to meet with the three concerto finalists the day before, meet their parents, talk to them and then what happens is the minute the competition's over all three of them are then looked after by us we're not promoting them but we're there to actually be almost like a buffer zone so we're there to organize all the concerts to help them structure the diary um anyone who comes in wanting dates the one thing i say to them is whoever speaks to you say that sounds amazing please call wica <laughs> because we're there to give them space, because there's so much pressure um, and a lot of questions for them to think about afterwards. Um, so that's why Wildcats, we've been there and a very important part of the competition. Wonderful. Um, so for anyone who's wanting to find out more about Wildcat and obviously not, not just your artists, but what you're doing to help support other musicians as well in your general mm. information, where can they find Wildcat on the uh, online space? Um, we've got all social media channels now, but of course the main website is the best place to delve into soulbycat.co.uk. Fantastic. Well, uh, if you've been watching live, thank you so much for joining us. It really is hugely appreciated. And again, if you're listening back to the podcast, um, if you want to, to watch anything online, if you're listening back, you can go on the, uh, the website david-taylor.org and watch back the video for all of the interviews. And likewise, if you're watching live and want to listen to anything, you can go onto the website and have a look back for any of the episodes on all your favourite places, which is like Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. You may, if you've also listened to a couple of podcasts, realise that I'm usually naff at ending these and I've actually vaguely worked out what I want to say at the end, which is a nice way to finish on. So um, thank you very much for, for watching and listening and uh, looking forward to, to being with you again next time. Thank you very much.